Hello, I welcome you all to our great symposium weekend here at Deutsches Film Museum, celebrating, of course, our Jubilee exhibition, Kubrick's 2001, 50 Years of a Space Odyssey. My name is Nils Daniel Peiler, I'm one of the curators of, of our exhibition, and I'm very pleased that uh, also my colleague and curator Tim Hepner is today here in the audience. Uh, hello, Tim. And um, I welcome you all to our opening of the symposium. We have um, much talks and a lot of screenings here for Saturday and Sunday in this very room. And I very warm welcome also our honored Kubrick expert and uh, speaker in our accompanying series, Peter Krämer, who is with us uh, tonight as well. And I just wanted to mention that uh, Peter's wonderful book from the BFI Film Classics series is back in print. Uh, at Bloomsbury now, so I strongly recommend that to you. Um, so for today, for the opening, we first have a keynote uh, by uh, Vincent Jonat from Bordeaux University about a transhuman odyssey, technologically enhanced bodies in 2001 a Space Odyssey. This keynote will last about um, half an hour, and then afterwards we will have plenty of time to discuss Vincent's keynote uh, with a Q&A with you. And afterwards we will have the screening around uh, one o'clock of Kubrick's early short films, so uh, The Seafarers, Flying Padre, and Day of the Fight. So that's the first um, two hours for today's opening of the symposium. I'm very happy to introduce to you Vincent Jonat. He's a PhD student at the University Bordeaux Montaigne. He's currently writing a thesis entitled Subjectivity and the Point of View in Stanley Kubrick's oeuvre from 2001 A Space Odyssey to Eyes Wide Shut. Jonat has uh, given several talks on Stanley Kubrick and has published various articles on 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Shining and Eyes Wide Shut. And he has just co-edited um, the Stanley Kubrick Nouveau Horizon, which appeared in the essay collection of Bordeaux University in 2018 as number 14. Um, Vincent also organized a wonderful conference, I have to say, last year in May 2017 in Bordeaux, so please join me in welcoming Vincent Jonas. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to open this very promising symposium, I must say. And I'd like to especially thank Niels for inviting me and for organizing all this. An anniversary conference is, to me, the perfect opportunity to reflect upon uh, the lasting impact of such a landmark film as 2001 The Space Odyssey. Its cultural impact is of course phenomenal and stretches well beyond the boundaries of cinema, as we should have plenty of opportunities to discuss during this symposium. In this talk, I would like to focus instead on the ethical and philosophical considerations uh, of the film in the hope of showing that the last 50 years, far from making them irrelevant, have only increased their pertinence. One such issue is, of course, the encounter of a man with an extraterrestrial superior life form, and the film's presentation of alien life has been widely analyzed. The issue of transhumanism, which I would like to explore today, is, co is closely connected to the former, and its consideration appears even more urgent in our society, since, unlike alien encounter, the transhumanist revolution is already underway. For the purpose of this talk, I will rely on David Roden's definition of, uh, of transhumanism. And uh, Roden distinguishes uh, transhumanism from the connected notion of post-humanism. Post-humanism refers to a species originating from humanity, but radically different from it, either AIs or human beings so technologically enhanced that they can no longer be considered humans. A transhuman, uh, on the other hand, uh, refers to, I quote, the itinerary for the perfection of human nature and the cultivation of human personal autonomy by technological means. So a transhuman is therefore a human being who has overcome some of his biological constraints thanks to technological enhancements. Such enhancements uh, may include genetically improving intelligence, suppressing diseases through DNA alterations, implanting electronic components into the human body in order to boost its capacities, and eventually maybe overcoming death itself 
through a mixture of nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, and other booming technologies such as robotics. The frontier between a transhuman and a post-human may therefore become blurry, as the more man is capable to alter the structure of his own self, and the more he may reach a state of his evolution when he no longer shares the characteristics of a human being. In recent years, the transhumanist ethics has firmly established itself as one of the driving forces of our society, through, through some of the world's leading economic powers, such as the GAFAs, so Google, Amazon, Facebook and Apple, which invest massive amounts of money in the hope to create a humanity 2.0. Ray Kurzweil, the world's leading transhumanist spokesman and Google's director of engineering, has famously declared that the first man to live for a thousand years was already born. Though Amazon's Alexa and Google Assistant may not yet be as charming as HAL 9000, the transhumanist revolution takes place in a context where artificial intelligence is becoming a reality. While Kubrick envisioned a computer capable to defeat men at chess in the year 2001, the world's leading chess player, Kaspar Roth, uh, was actually beaten by IBM's Deep Blue software five years earlier, in 1996. And only last May, Google advertised a new vocal assistant, supposedly capable to have phone calls with a human being who could never guess that he is speaking to a machine. This modern revolution has, of course, influenced contemporary visual arts as a myriad of films and TV shows now question transhumanist and posthumanist issues. To name but a few, AI human relationships have uh, recently been depicted in Battlestar Galactica, Westworld, Ex Machina, or even Blade Runner 2049. Humans' technological triumph over death is envisioned in the recent Amazon series Altered Carbon, while transhumanist enhancements are evoked in auto works, such as Denis Villeneuve's Arrival, while also being the basis of most contemporary superhero blockbusters like Iron Man or X-Men. Those works tend to depict transhumanism as either an exhilarating, empowering prospect or as a challenge that could potentially destroy humanity. In this context, it is all the more important to preserve the legacy of 2001 A Space Odyssey, as it can be considered as the very first uh, major film to depict transhumanism, and arguably one of the very first major works of art to do so. At least ever since Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in 1818, science fiction has always reflected upon the potential for science to raise mankind above their limitations. However, transhumanism as an ethics encouraging such uh, evolutions only began to emerge in the 1930s and truly took shape in 1957 when the term was coined by Julian Huxley, brother of Aldous Huxley. In 1962, biologist Jean Rostand wrote how, I quote, the most daring bet in human history for man to transform himself will be realized sooner than we think, end of quote. Before Kubrick, few artists ever envisioned transhumanism as a probable upcoming development. Among those, one may uh, mention Isaac Asimov, or 2001's very own co-writer Arthur C. Clarke, whose 1953 novel Childhood, Childhood's End sorry, of, is often considered as one of the very first transhumanist works. In 1961, Clarke wrote an essay entitled The Evolutionary Cycle from Man to Machine, in which he exposes his firm transhumanist belief that, I quote, the evolutionary, si uh, sorry, biological evolution has given way to a far more rapid process, technological evolution. If Clark may thus be considered as one of the earliest transhumanist thinkers, Kubrick himself was no less explicitly aware of this issue. In his 1968 New York Times interview, he declared, I quote, it's generally thought that after a highly developed science gets you past the mortality stage, you become part animal, part machine, then all machine, eventually perhaps pure energy. We cannot imagine what a million year jump in science will produce in life forms. Pure spirit may be the ultimate form that intelligence would seek. So we can therefore conclude that both artists envision uh, the technological enhancement of mankind as an inevitable process the, log the logical outcome of man's evolution, which does not mean that they were not aware of the fundamental risks entailed by such a revolution. 
I would like to suggest that far from restricting the transhumanist debate to an often sterile dichotomy between a bioconservative uh, dystopian viewpoint and a blind futurist optimism, 2001 rather displaces the issue by confronting a dehumanizing transhuman world with a life-affirming posthuman outcome. Seen through this prism, the Dawn of Man sequence enables 2001 to prepare for the oncoming reflection on technology. As a symbol for the transitions from apes to humans, this sequence goes against the often-held bioconservative belief that holds technology as a corrupting influence on mankind. Through this encounter with the alien monolith, Moon Watcher indeed acquires a human intelligence which is indistinguishable from the advent of technology. The humanoid's intelligence manifests itself through his use of the bone as a tool. Clark wrote, I quote, the first users of tools were not men, but pre-humanoid anthropoids. The old idea that man invented tools is therefore a misleading half-truth. It would be more accurate to say that tools invented man. And 2001 indeed shows technology to be an intrinsically human characteristic. Transhumanism, therefore, is, not, is no more than a modern amplification of man's development through technology, which is inherent to our species. As David Roden explains, I quote, many argue that those who see cyborgs as colonized and invaded flesh fail to understand that humans have always extended themselves through devices. The philosopher Andy Clark has argued that the integration of technology into biology has defined humans since the development of flint tools. We are, he claims, natural born cyborgs. Kubrick's Iconic jump cut connecting the Moon Watcher's bone to the futuristic spacecraft implies a similar idea. The spaceships that enable mankind to travel through such incredibly uh, hostile environments are to be understood as mere improvements from the bone which enabled Moon Watcher to increase his physical strength and defeat his rivals. The transhuman odyssey which Kubrick invites us to go through is therefore to be understood not as a revolution, but as the natural outcome in the journey of mankind. Kubrick's future does not explicitly depict technological enhancements directly integrated within the characters' bodies, as most modern transhumanist films do, although the issue of genetic modification was thought of during the film's pre-production. A 1965 letter regarding the character's makeup, sold in the, in the Stanley Kubrick archives and sent to Kubrick by Roger Karras, who is actively involved in acquiring scientific data for the film in California, explains that, I quote, the premise that the makeup designers worked on here is that in the year 2001, everybody will be beautiful if they want to be. All structural defects in the face, in the hair, in the completion will be re readily curable by medical means. I wish it had been true. <laughs> the film does hint at genetic modifications through the general lack of physical defects in the film's characters, Nobody wears glasses, for instance. But mankind's intermingling with technology in Kubrick's future is mostly extracorporeal. In stark contrast to the humanoids facing the bare wilderness of Africa and the vast stretches of the horizon, human bodies have become enclosed within layers and layers of technological envelopes. The characters wear fully unicolor clothes, which look like a second skin, they are locked within spacesuits, capsules, pods, and spaceships. Technology is depicted as a necessary uterus-like protective environment <coughs> needed to survive beyond the biological constraints of our species. For all intents and purposes, the film's characters are thus to be understood as cyborgs, as a mixture of organic and cybernetic elements deeply interconnected. Though Floyd or Bowman are a far cry from today's dominant representations of cyborgs, epitomized by such characters as Robocop. Let us keep in mind that the term cyborg was originally coined by scientists Manfred Klein and Nathan Klein in an article entitled Cyborgs and Space in order to characterize 1960s astronauts as technologically enhanced humans whose cybernetic spacesuits maintained and regulated their biological functions. Modern humanity thus appears to have evolved towards machine-like beings. 
or the film's actors display a highly mechanistic, rigid performance which emphasizes the active role of technology in shaping mankind. The rectilinear structure of the posture sorry, of the characters, emphasized by their clothes, associates them to the artificial shape of the monolith itself and contrasts with the roundish shapelessness of the humanoids in the first sequence. In the words of Samazulis, the film's characters appear to be caught in a process of uh, becoming machine, as the path towards the transcendence of our biological limits brings us closer and closer to the technical perfections of machines. The film's characters seem desirous to erase their biological natures. Not only do they hide it behind plain clothes, they also limit all physical interactions to a minimum and appear conspicuously asexual. As a culmination of man's becoming machine, Dave Bowman appears singularly inorganic. Keir Dolly's wonderfully neutral performance, underlined with various close-ups emphasizing his rigidly slick hair and sallow complexion, makes his, look, his character look like an automaton. Yet, this process is far from perfect, as the numerous references to bodily functions attest throughout the film. From the ordeal of space toilets, to the various depictions of unappetizing food, the references to humans' corporeal need abound and tend to appear humorously absurd or even grotesque. Describing Frank Poole's first scene during which the character jogs around the spaceship Discovery, Kate McQuiston writes, I quote, his likeness to a hamster in a wheel is an incisive reminder of man's physical nature as an animal, one that must exercise to maintain itself, to carry out its tasks and to remain healthy. I would add that the most striking reminder of man's organic condition occurs when Bowman leaves the ship in order to fix its antenna. Let's see the extract. If I can. Oh, and maybe I cannot. Ah, there we go. on for quite some time. As the immensity of space surrounds the character, the thin layer of technological protection afforded by the spacesuit seems a meager protection indeed, while the subjective sound of the character's breathing, echoing the only sound Bowman may hear in his silent environment, is a highly chilling reminder of man's basic need to breathe. Man's corporeal nature thus appears like a burden, a dead weight machines have to make up for. On the other hand, technology fits its spatial environment perfectly, as spaceships appear to be dancing in a galactic ballet written by Richard Strauss. Ease, grace and fluidity characterize those spaceships while within them, human characters move in a heavy, awkward walk, forced as they are to mimic gravity with grip shoes or other such devices. If humans appear asexual, technology seems imbued with reproductive powers uh, as the landing of Floyd's capsule within the space station, of course, unmistakably evokes penetration. The beauty of the opening space sequence, celebrating the spectacular achievement of mankind, is therefore set against a depiction of mankind itself as an obsolete species, a backward dweller shrunk by the very world in he has created. Through implication of sexual reproduction, te technology seems to symbolize the future while mankind appears sterile. It is, of course, about the discovery that such an impression materializes, as the superintelligent computer HAL 9000 comes to consider his human fellow travelers a liability, 
whose human weaknesses may hinder the success of the mission and who therefore need to be eliminated. As Simone Odino points out, Clark himself at first expressed some doubts as to the pertinence of such a, a sequence, so uh, the struggle between Hal and the uh, astronauts, which he felt might appear like a scene artificially added for dramatic purposes while unfitting the main narrative. And perhaps Simone will tell us more about that uh, tomorrow, I think. Indeed, if one only considers Hal as a post-human superintelligence, which, though created by man, uh, radically overshadows us, then this sequence might seem like an unnecessary doubling of Bowman's encounter with aliens, uh, an intrusion of Isaac Asimov's universe into an Arthur C. Clarke narrative. There is indeed no cause and effect chain linking Hal's aggression uh, to Bowman's alien encounter. Yet, I would suggest that this juxtaposition offers a symbolical coherence as a, as a typically Kubrickian reflection upon humanity's relationship with technology, if one considers Hal as the apotheosis of mankind's transhuman odyssey. Whereas Moonwatcher's bone is used in order for the character to impose his will upon his rivals, technology in 2001 rather seems to deprive the characters of will and agency human volition has been transferred onto intelligent machines, while humans can simply go on living, safely enclosed within a technological womb that takes care of all their needs, feeds them, relaxes them, and distracts them, while overlooking them with a panoptic perspective. The film suggests that the evolution of mankind has tended to favor comfort and safety provided by technology at the expense of agency and free will. As the completion of mankind's transhumanist agenda, Hal is the ultimate paternalistic figure watching over his humans while relieving them of the burdens of choice and liberty. In a pre-production note written from Kubrick's hand and stored at the Stanley Kubrick archives, the director summarizes Paul and Bowman's uh, role inside this autonomous spaceship. I quote, they are caretakers. Indeed, the astronauts are not even aware of the purpose of their mission and, all, and thus only take care to its day-to-day -day maintenance. While, Heil, while sorry, Hal acts as the eyes and brain of this self-contained environment. Aboard the discovery, man has become himself an agent of technology, Sam Azulis explains. The author makes a parallel with the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, according to whom technology now exists uh, for its own sake, regardless of the benefits for mankind, who now serves the very creation whose initial purpose was to serve humanity. However, one must keep in mind that thanks to the Dawn of Man sequence, the film does not leave this pos the possibility for spectators to view this critical depiction of technology uh, and of progress as a reactionary fantasy in favor of a return to a pre-technological utopia. In addition, technology is depicted as both digitalizing and fascinatingly beautiful. The digitalization provoked by machines must therefore be considered as stemming from mankind's very own transhuman fantasy, rather than from any problem inherent to technology and progress themselves. Throughout the futuristic sequences, it is made clear that transhuman developments have provided protection from both liberty and organic weaknesses. In the very first scene displaying a human being, Dr. Floyd is seen asleep in his space pod languidly floating in zero gravity while safely fastened to his seat, like a baby rocked in his cradle. Rather than a stimulating, life-affirming uh, enhancement, technology's main accomplishment, therefore, appears to be to protect mankind from all negative stimuli ex experienced by the ape men. It provides a protection from fear, hunger, want, and ultimately death. Enclosing mankind within pre-programmed space pods provides security from all the contingencies of organic life. And the logical outcome of such enhancements, therefore, is this. Locked in technological sarcophagi, the vital functions of the other astronauts aboard the Discovery are preserved by Hal, charted onto a computer screen, uh, while the character's hibernation enables them not to feel pain and not to age. Mankind's technological fantasy thus seems to um, have taken them to a hybrid state, in between life and death, protected from mortality by denying any actual life. 
According to anti-transhumanist French philosopher Jean-Michel Besnier, becoming cyborg enables security to triumph above all else, which necessitates the suppression of contingency, which is yet an inherent quality of life. In Beyond the Pleasure uh, Principle, Sigmund Freud famously analyzes what he describes as an urge for organic life to restore to an earlier state of things. The psychoanalyst calls this tendency the death drive, I want them to pronounce the German term, uh, by using technology as a means to suppress all negative stimuli, a means to avoid death by escaping all the contingencies inherent to life itself, the transhuman impulse depicted in 2001 thus paradoxically seems to have been dictated by mankind's very own death drive. As Hal decides to kill the astronauts, the computer thus symbolically accomplishes the death drive at the core of humanity's entire technological quest. According to Philip Kubersky, I quote, Hal is Kubrick's ultimate expression of technology's failed attempt to transcend human contingency and corporeality. But I would rather suggest that Hal's murderous intent may thus symbolically be seen as the successful outcome of mankind's very own transhumanist fantasy whose deadly consequences the supercomputer embodies. Many critics have commented upon uh, the unprecedented emotional pugnancy that Hal acquires once he faces disconnections at the hand of Bowman. As the computer faces mortality, it ceases to embody mankind's own immortal death drive and as a result becomes more alive, thus implying the ideal of immortality to be antithetic to life itself. Kubrick's depiction of how this parallels the argument nowadays uh, developed by thinkers critical of transhumanism, such as Jean-Michel Besnier, who also reasserts the necessity of mortality for life to exist in any meaningful way. 2001, however, does not stop at the confrontation with Hal and goes on to depict Bowman's transformation into the astral fetus, of course, a post-human cyborg gifted with unimaginable powers. Hal's death may thus take on a symbolic dimension. As Bowman manages to overcome the deathly outcome of transhumanism, he paves the way for a regeneration in which technological enhancements serve a life-affirming purpose. The sequence of Bowman's confrontation with Hal therefore acts as a first rebirth, away from the deadly clutch of man's own technological fantasy towards the character's actual rebirth into a post-human. And I've got an extract to show how much of a rebirth it is. editing in the end. Uh, the birth symbolism of this scene is particularly striking, of course, as the character seems to be expulsed from his technological womb. Locked in, in his space pod without helmet, Bowman decides to throw himself into space without the help of any technological envelope, in a desperate attempt at survival. Bowman's vitality is therefore reaffirmed as the character faces death devoid of the substitute of immortality afforded by technology. The radical contrast this scene offers with the previous sequence is conveyed through the suddenly accelerating rhythm, as Bowman's expulsion triggers a sense of action, which continues thanks to the dynamic handheld shots showing the character's advance through the discovery, and culminates in his fantastic journey through the stars up until his transformation. This newly found rhythm contrasts with the previous sequence in which acting, filming and montage combine to convey a feeling of stasis. While the opening shot of the hamster wheel of the discovery suggests a purposeless, claustrophobic, rotating movement, 
characters become more and more fixed, as does the camera which rests upon daily activities deployed at length. Such stasis is accentuated by exterior shots, as, uh, sorry, during which the spaceships or its space pods seem completely static, even though they move at incredible speed, by lack of any referring object which could highlight their movement. While the stasis of the discovery sequence suggests the ultimately deadly outcome of mankind's technological progress, then the reoccurrence of a feeling of progress implies the highly life-affirming nature of Bowman's process of transformation into a post-human. A far cry from his previous transhuman numberness, Bowman's journey in Jupiter and Beyond the Infinite challenges the very limits of human perception and cognition. The Stargate sequence is interspersed with still shots of Bowman's uh, reaction, during which uh, uh, Keir Dully, sorry, displays an unprecedented level of emotional expressiveness, as awe and pain mix up to suggest an experience aching to religious rapture. Having left the self-enclosing world of technological wounds, Bowman experiences the world anew. His mysterious landing in an 18th century room acts as another symbolical renunciation to, uh, the of the, the transhumanist ethos. The character leaves his space suit and space pod to be replaced with a timeless bathrobe, which leaves the character devoid of all post-industrial technology. One could even interpret Bowman's mysterious breaking of the glass as another suppression of mankind's uh, established use of technology in its most archaic form. Whether or not such an, such an interpretation holds, the very interpretative, interpretative openness of this last sequence implies a level of cognitive stimulation which goes against the numb, self-centered comfort provided by mankind's previous technological hibernation. And most importantly for our topic, Bowman's transformative experience is grounded in mortality. In a, in a series of shot reverse shot pairings, the character sees his older self only to be turned into him an instant later, up until the character lays dying. It is only then, after Bowman has experienced mortality, that he is somehow reborn into the astral fetus. While the transhumanist agenda sought to avoid death by all means, Bowman now goes through a death-like process which instills the meaning of life back uh, into Bowman's experience. While the transhumanist ethos wishes to preserve the individual ad infinitum, Bowman's rebirth entails a transformation into a creature radically different. Instead of trying to maintain one's wholeness into a permanent stasis, Kubrick's depiction of post-humanism brings forth an acceptance of change, evolution, and even mortality as the inherent conditions of life. As the astral fetus returns to Earth, it becomes obvious that the creature has incorporated an incredibly advanced technology, enabling it to evolve through space. Uh, Kubrick once again stages an acute sensory stimulation which contrasts with the previous transhuman apathy. The lyrical tone of the Spake Zarathustra, combined with the emphasis on the creature's giant eyes, as well as its nakedness, uh, sorry, to establish its relation to the outside world as both intellectual and central. Whereas transhumanism saw technology incorporated over the human bodies, thus depicting it as a protective envelope also acting as a prison, limiting one's sensory relation to the world, Posthuman technology is therefore incorporated and leaves uh, the body exposed to its environment. The fetus seems to be able to move through space effortlessly, just like the spaceships themselves. While the body uh, of the astral fetus is separated from the void by a thin, transparent ray of light. Whereas in his interview, Kubrick declared envisioning the possibility of a humanity devoid of body, 2001 therefore seems to reassert the necessity of an incarnated humanity as the body appears as the only vector of central relation to the outside world, at least the only vector understandable by mankind, as the off-screen aliens may have developed alternatives that uh, we are free to imagine, of course. I therefore believe uh, 2001 still offers an extraordinarily unique 
uh, artistic reflection upon mankind's technological becoming. Avoid, avoiding sterile dichotomies between a utopian transhumanism and a wrongly nostalgic bioconservatism, the film instead opposes two different directions that can be taken by humanity. While transhumanism leads mankind to fulfill a death drive shown as inherent to his search for comfort and immortality, Bowman's posthumanity offers a radically more optimistic uh, outcome, envisioning a life-affirming transformation which expands mankind's vitality through cognitive and sensual enhancements. The film thus goes against the widespread conception that posthumanism is the logical, radical outcome of transhumanism. Instead, the true evolution that is posthumanism must be achieved uh, by going against the deadly impulse at the core of our current transhumanism. Not unlike Nietzsche's Ubermensch, the evolution of Kubrick's uh, posthuman is above all marked by an enhancement of life affirming qualities rather than mere technological progress. Bowman's transformation was, of course, not chosen as the character is blessed with powers given by an alien species whose technological superiority gives it a godlike quality. Nonetheless, Bowman's defeat of Hal, seen as a victory over mankind's death-driven technology, implies a symbolical causality which earns the character the right to be granted a life-affirming technological evolution, while the alien's very own superiority, uh, and Bowman's apparent submission to their will, suggests the need for humans to let go of their highly anthropocentric desire for self-preservation at all costs and accept change, evolution, and even death as the very conditions of life. As the astral fetus eventually looks straight uh, at the camera in the film's last shot, the spectator is encouraged to consider how the direction taken by contemporary humanity will determine the fate of the species. By opposing a static, enclosed transhuman odyssey going against the very foundation of cinema, as an art of movement, duration, and perceptual and cognitive stimulation, to a final part using all the possibilities of montage and special effects to induce an awesome stimulation, the film itself becomes a, so a showcase for the life-affirming potentiality human technology may already hold. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent, for the stimulating keynote. I guess there are some remarks or questions in the audience to Vincent Jonas. Uh, just please raise your hand um, and I come to you with the mic because we're also recording audio and video uh, for the whole symposium weekend and uh, you will find all the talks afterwards on our YouTube channel. So are there any first remarks or questions, comments to Vincent? Thanks, thanks ever so much for this. This, this was great. Um, I'm not sure whether it, it raises more questions than it answers, but I guess, like the film itself, that would be a very good thing. Um, I, I like the emphasis on the bodily in, in your analysis, and I'm wondering what you make of the fact... I mean, I have a lot of things to say, but let's just start with one thing. Is the film not also just emphasizing in a very relaxed way the bodily dependency that never changes or the dependence on our body and its functions that never changes, whether we're in space or on Earth? So, so there's this lovely continuity between the hominids, uh, the astronauts, and even uh, Bowman in the so-called hotel room, uh, where there's a strong emphasis on sleeping, eating, drinking. Uh, sometimes, in the, in, if we exclude the, the, the hotel room, shitting, grooming, you know, all these basic physical uh, activities. Uh, and I think that that also takes a little bit of the sting out of, you know, this negative reading of what the astronauts are. They're basically doing still the same things, you know, they're not, in a sense, more dehumanized 
because uh, that seems to be part of the, the traditional argument about the astronauts, that they're somewhat dehumanized. No, they're still they're exercising, they're playing, they're grooming themselves, and so on and so, on and so forth. Um, so this basic continuity runs through the whole film. Uh, does that affect your, your analysis? You know, because y you're still saying now that there's something totally dehumanized about the astronauts in space. Uh, wouldn't we say that the film emphasizes their basic humanity, or, but through simple things, through the, the, the basic bodily functions throughout the whole film, right up to the, the hotel room, and it's only the star child where this dependency is 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 questioned this because we don't know there's no um, umbilical cord which might feed if it is still a, a fetus it would need an umbilical cord to be fed um there, there are other things that this body might need uh, that it's not provided for anymore so would you say there is a certain you know continuity in which the basic uh, dependence of, of humans on their bodies uh, is is in a sense maintained uh, and foregrounded throughout the whole film until the star child comes in. Oh yes, I completely agree, and which is why I think that transhumanism actually is no is not shown as a divide, uh, as something radically new, but actually just the continuation of what it means to be human. Um, I would say that it depends on uh, the definition of humanity. Uh, the animality of mankind is definitely stressed throughout the the whole film with the emphasis on all the bodily functions. Um, by stressing dehumanized, I guess that to me Kubrick rather stresses a critic, a, a criticism, sorry, against what humans perceive themselves to be as humans, as purely rational beings. And, um, and in this sense, of course, progress has shown something like shrinking into just mere automatons. But the, animali the animality of humanity uh, is definitely maintained throughout the whole film. and But I would say that it doesn't necessarily go against the idea of a dehumanization in, uh, in 2001, as men themselves have tended not to see themselves as animals, but as just kind of transcendent uh, spirits, in a way. And in this sense, just showing their animality again and again and again just puts them back to their right place, we could say. And I think that it was very daring to have possibly the first uh, highly ambitious science fiction film in the history of cinema to lay so much emphasis on toilets and foods because it really goes against this kind of ode to human intelligence that we assume to be connected to science fiction in general. So yeah, I agree. Other questions, remarks, yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for your uh, insight. And um, what amazes me in the whole movie is when you compare it to um, more recent uh, science fiction movies, uh, the whole mission, uh, there is no uh, uh, organization behind it that initiated the mission. Um, why this spaceship is being travel traveling and the human species we see on the spaceship are, I would say, servants. They are servants to the technology, to HAL 9000. But who actually is the brain behind all this? We don't know. Might it be something like the space child? But I don't want to emphasize on this question. It's just amazing. We don't have it. We, If we look at the, the Star Trek movies or something like that, you mentioned it, uh, there's always some organization behind it that initiated the missions or the wars or whatever, or the control of space to protect Earth or some organization or some uh, species. We don't have this here. So it could be born from some other computer, not necessarily mankind. And uh, mankind is mortal and it's being pictured as mortal till the end when we see this hotel room scene where it's clearly to see that Borman is at the end of his life. He is a mortal being and he will die very soon. And the curiosity to start such a mission is not human curiosity, amazingly. It's coming somewhere else. And 
that's a factor I haven't seen uh, in discussion a lot. And uh, I would like your opinion uh, to hear about that one. I completely agree. Thank you. Uh, any other movie would have spent at least 20 minutes uh, with a scene in the White House showing the president saying, oh, we've got to go there. It's so mysterious. We've got to keep it away from the public. And here people just seem to be going with emotion as if it's just something we do no questions asked we're just here and okay let's go up until the end uh, definitely and uh, we could expand this remark to the entire kubrick filmography whenever we see men supposed to be in a position of power they're never really at the head of power there's something very kafka-like in this uh, structure in this hierarchical structure in society People are always the temporary representative of powers, but they always follow someone else's power whose uh, presence is never shown. And even in the clockwork orange, we never see the actual prime minister. We just see the minister of the interior, for instance, or in Barry Lyndon, we barely see the king, but himself seems to be a kind of puppet just going through the motion and so on. There's never actually anyone just making the decision which is also why I think that uh, the uh, reference to Martin Heidegger, which I quoted, which is by Sam Azulis, uh, seems to me to be very relevant because the system, the whole technological system that mankind has created seems nowadays to be just dictating uh, what we have to do, just making us go, uh, follow the movement in a way, which is why I think that even though uh, there are uh, lots of references to human animality, I think that the subjectivity of the characters is really put into question. So yes, I agree. So thank you very much for your enlightening insights into this question of uh, humanism, transhumanism, posthumanism. I always wondered in the movie, why is there always these central perspectives? And, and now it just came to my mind that maybe it implies on a on a aesthetic level the humanistic perspective because uh, the perspective was an invention of the renaissance and actually of the humanism of the birth of the humanism so on an on an aesthetic level there's always uh, this renaissance view of the world established and only in the last sequence in the hotel it's more the surveillance it's not central perspective anymore it's always more like being viewed from something else outside I agree, thank you very much. Um, in my PhD, I tend to describe the whole uh, Kubrick's treatment on subjectivity as a desire to decenter human perspective from the film. And we can always see the, uh, well, of course, the very famous failure of those centered perspectives, those panoptic gaze, whether from the Overlook Hotel in The Shining or House desire to just center everything and in the middle of the frame just to be able to control the visuals all the time and i agree it seems to be something of a of a humanistic anthro anthropocentrism reflected in uh, kubrick's very own uh, filming uh, which in 2001 is set against uh, as you said the end which might almost feel like we are witnessing an alien point of view on human beings, but also the, the very beginning, the long silent, uh, sorry, the long um, uh, beginning in black with only Ligeti's music being heard, which feels like we are witnessing something pre-human, which being all black, we cannot witness ourselves, which is kind of a, well, of a humility uh, standpoint, because we are just meant to see from the very beginning of such an ambitious movie aiming to describe the whole history of mankind, that the whole history of mankind is set against a backdrop of the unknown, everything that we cannot uh, put our eyes on. So uh, I completely agree. I would say that Kubrick has both this desire to show this panoptic uh, perspective kind of reflecting anthropocentrism, this very uh, egocentric uh, depiction of mankind, but always uh, reflecting it with uh, an exterior perspective, as it were, something uh, just showing the very limits of this centralist viewpoint. And uh, it's very interesting to see that HAL 9000, for instance, seems absolutely uh, almighty within the discovery, but it doesn't have even one camera 
looking outside his own ship, apparently. We don't even know whether he's capable to see the universe because when Bowman is outside, that's how he defeats it. So that this centralization of the point of view always seems to uh, bring forth uh, the capacity for destruction, for being just destroyed at some point. So yes, I completely agree. Uh, thank you for your talk. It's very inspiring. And um, you presented the jump cut. Is this jump cut implying some kind of post apism, or is it some kind of continuity? Because there's the bone used as a weapon, and the satellites you see surrounding Earth are, I think, intended as weapons in space. Yes. Well, the, the humorous aspect, of course, is that one may consider just with all how much man seems to have accomplished through this cut, just going from a bone to a spaceship. But of course, one is meant to understand that all that has just happened in the flick uh, of, of a second, and that in the grand scheme of things, just to uh, go back on our last point, it just doesn't represent anything. What man calls progress and so on is actually just a microsecond in the grand scheme of things, which also uh, questions uh, our very own humanism in a way, because we are just, once again, users of tools, you know, using them to possibly destroy each other, although uh, the final film leaves that aspect more open, because at first, well, and in Clark's uh, novel, we actually supposed to understand that the ship itself is supposed to carry nuclear bombs, so this would have been much more explicit now we don't really know what's going on, but we do have a reference to the Cold War coming on uh, real soon, which refers to the uh, ape man's own confrontation over the, the water itself. So yes, all uh, of our grandiose achievements, which are celebrated with the space ballet, it's unquestionably wonderful and beautiful, a beautiful scene, but they are also humorously implied to mean absolutely nothing. I agree. Any other questions or remarks to Vincent Jonas? Yes, there's one more by Peter Kramer. <laughs> I couldn't get off so easily. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I really have to say that the discussion, I mean, having read thousands of pages about uh, uh, 2001, uh, having written a few hundred myself, uh, it is quite intriguing that there's always new stuff coming up. And, and uh, I must say that the one thing that disturbs me in your analysis is that the end point of whatever, if there is a development, the end point is the eternal life for the astronauts in cryogenic sleep. I think that is a truly, I hadn't really thought about it in that way. That's a truly disturbing uh, point, um, which I have to still process. I, I would just want to make two comments. One is that Hal is in a sense, if the film is critiquing something about anthropology, Anthropocentrism, can't pronounce it properly. Uh, but, but, oh, let's say the that we overvaluing ourselves uh, as being special. Uh, then, of course, Hal is the extreme example of this because Hal thinks he's perfect, and that, of course, is the downfall. So Hal is actually uh, more human than human in that respect, and and th that comes up in the dialogue a little bit. Um, uh, and and so, in a sense, Hal is not technology as the other. Hell is just uh, um, what is wrong about humanity uh, squared. Uh, so I think that, that's quite interesting that, that the technology takes on human weaknesses. Um, but the, the, the one thing I, I would want to insist on is I think it's wrong when we talk about bio biology to talk about animality as if there is something human which goes beyond the animal. The animal is our body and the human is something beyond. I mean. If I understand the, the thrust of your argument, that's exactly the problem. So when I say the film foregrounds physicality and then you call it animality, we're falling back into the, the same old problem, that, that the human can't be thought beyond, it cannot be thought what it might be beyond the body. So we shouldn't talk about animality as if, as if it is something else or something old or something different. That's us. Um, so that nevertheless raises the question of what the star child is. Can you say a little bit more about what that star child represents? And if it's the post-human, as you may know from Childhood's End, Childhood's End has a, has a terribly bittersweet ending 
because humanity just dies out. The post-human, the humans give, give birth to children who join a hive mind, which will then eventually join the cosmic overmind, and humans will just stay on Earth until they die, and then it's all over. So it's, it's a bittersweet thing. How do you read the ending of, of 2001, whether, whether you take into account the novel or not? Uh, is the star child representing of where all of humans, individual humans will go, where humanity as a species will go, or is the, the, uh, the star child an alternative to humanity, even a threat to humanity, which of course a lot of people have seen both in the film and especially in the novel? Well, uh, first of all, just to go back on animality, I must have been uh, very unclear, sorry about that, but I actually completely agree with you. Uh, my point was rather um, that Kubrick himself, I think, just puts people back in their right place, which is just being an animal instead of this rational, uh, transcendent conception of mankind as a superior intelligence, so I completely agree. Um, as for the Star Child, of course, like everyone else, I don't have any answer. Uh, I think that Kubrick himself would have been lucid enough to see that every evolution would entail, uh, of course, something painful and uh, a loss for the rest of humanity. So I would tend to uh, have a hard time imagining it to be a utopian revolution in which everybody happily transforms into a Star Child. I agree. Um, but I think that the... Um, the rupture in uh, our own uh, well, humanity, not being a human anymore, is actually depicted in a rather positive light because it's what I uh, talked about uh, in accepting mortality. It's not necessarily accepting the fact of dying because we don't know whether the star child is immortal or not and we don't really care, but we must accept not uh, being fixed in uh, the universe and the center of the universe forever. And so that implies at some point, just like the bittersweet ending in uh, Childhood's End, that implies that humanity has an end point and that if we just keep evolving, there will be a point in which we have to say goodbye to humanity as we know it. That's inevitable, but in a way that is something that has to be wished for if the alternative is just to remain, as we said, in a sarcophagi and live forever in a half-life. Maybe I can just add to that. Um, when you look at the characters you see in the movie, especially Borman, for example, they seem not to be very high skilled or intelligent or creative uh, uh, species or, or uh, humans. They are very much based on their animal behaviors. As I said, said prior, uh, they act more like servants. And we don't see uh, intellectual achievements in the movies from uh, people that are actually acting. They're very passive. They're very much event driven. Uh, as I said, they're not creative. And th maybe they're not really intelligent. They're very uh, basic, simple people, as it looks like. And I think that is also amazing to, to recognize this factor. What would you like to comment on that? Yes, I agree. Um, depends on what we mean by intelligence, because they have a highly uh, evolved, logical, uh, rational intelligence, in the sense that we can see them playing chess, although they're defeated, of course, but that still uh, takes a lot of logic and rationality. Uh, but they have absolutely no creativity, I agree. And, uh, I think that it's once again a constant in Kubrick's work and we can think once again of The Shining and Jack's uh, completely failed writing. Uh, so yes, I, I would say that there's something about technological evolution as just taking away all of, all of our life force because in a way life is about creativity, uh, the possibility to transcend our own condition and so on and so forth. So yes, completely agree. It's not really a... A very long comment, sorry, but it's because I agree. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for thank this you. brilliant opening talk, Vincent. Uh, please join me in giving another round of applause to Vincent Jonas. Thank you very much.